HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Heritage Radio Network is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Welcome to the Grape Nation, your weekly wine journey. Our guest is Christina Mariani May. We'll talk to Christina about Bonfi, Tuscany, women in wine, and more. We have a bunch of Bonfi wines in front of us to taste for our weekly wine sip. I'm your host, Sam Ben Ruby. Stay with us for the Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We bring wine to the people. Christina Mariani May is a third-generation winemaker. Her grandparents were born in the U.S. and went back to their roots in Italy in the early 1900s. Ironically, her father and uncle headed back to Italy in the late 70s to create Castello Bonfi and Brunello di Montalcino. Bonfi is now the largest contiguous vineyard in Europe. Christina joined Bonfi in the early 90s and has been the president and CEO since 2018. Christina is one of the most prominent women in wine and oversees import, distribution, and wineries in Tuscany, I think Piedmont, the Pacific Northwest. Um, She's very much in tune to work-life balance, family first, and that's essential to Christina's success. So welcome to the Grape Nation, Christina. I just wanted to ask you something on the intro. Were your grandparents born here, went to Italy and came back? So I got that right. Okay. Yes, that was my grandfather. Yeah, I yes. thought when he was they a were boy. there, came here, and then, okay, so we'll get into that. Um, we're talking to Christina at Bonfi headquarters on Long Island in New York. Um, beautiful space. I'm actually behind Christina is her dad's old office, right? Mm-hmm. Which is very cool. All right, so let's get started. Um I mean, I know a lot about the brand. I've drank a lot of the wine. Of course, I research my shows and everything. But I think to understand Bonfi, where you came from, um, you need to tell us a little about family history because that leads into the founding of Bonfi. And I'm here with you, so I want to know how you came into the business. Now, let me just give you a pointer. We could do a whole show on the history of Bonfi. There are other things I want to talk to. So don't rush it, but realize, you know, I want to get to a lot of things about what you're doing and the wineries and all that. Sure. So first of all, Sam, thank you so much for this opportunity. It's my pleasure to be here. It is so wonderful to have you here. I'm going to bring us to Tuscany for a moment. (laughs) Sort of feels Um, like it. (laughs) Yes, we're on this beautiful Gold Coast estate in Long Island, which is our home away from home. Um, So, yes, our family goes back to a great story. 1919, my grandfather started a wine importing company 
in Greenwich Village, Little Italy, New York. And he named it Bonfi after the aunt whom he loved. But as we sit here in our living room here at this great old estate, um, my grandfather was so fortunate because he was actually born in Connecticut and his parents were Italian, but they were carriage makers. So they, they were simple folk. Um, and like they horse and carriage makers? Yeah, horse and carriage. Okay. You're talking 19, you know, right. 1880s. Okay. Um, and they wanted him to be raised outside by a family member in Italy who was quite prominent at the time. Mm. So when my grandfather, John Mariani Sr., was only 10, he was shipped back to Italy. So he was born here, but sent to Sarono, which is uh, near Milano. And he was saying, Is that Amaretto di Sarono? Yes, yes. Same spelling, Amaretto, same place. Amaretto, right, the right. cookies, yeah, same yeah. town, right? <laughs> town right outside of, of Montalcino. Okay. I mean, Montalcino, Milan. And um, Sodono was actually home to a lot of prominent leaders of the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church. So my great great aunt, his aunt, Teodilinda Banfi, became head of the household for the Archbishop of Milan, wow. who was from Serono. And then the Archbishop of Milan in early 1900s was elected to become Pope Pius XI. Wow. So Talk about hanging around with the right people. Talking about <laughs> the carriage makers knew Jesus. where their son should be raised. So she was actually, Teodolinda Banfi was the first woman, speaking <clears throat> about women in business or women in the history of our company, she was the first woman who was not a nun, to be allowed to move within the Vatican City. And she lived in the Pope's quarters and wow. ran his entire personal life. And when she died, Sam, she was honored to be the first woman who was not a nun to be buried within the Vatican wow. City as well. So she really was like the adopted sister. You got to name the company after her. Exactly. Right? And she raised my grandfather for 10 years. So he learned all about wine, food, culture, especially of Italy. So at 20, so he's a young man, he comes back to Italy. Italy, and of course, goes to New York City to Little Italy and starts importing products from Italy, particularly wine, and named the company Banfi after the aunt who much he loved like a mom. So he started in the import business. Mm -hmm. How much of it you think was wine? Half of it? Well, third? it started out as um, three quarters wine. And then guess what happened right after 1919 Prohibition? Oh, right. So that was a shift. Right. <laughs> so what they would sell, and we actually have bottles of this in our living room, but they would sell the Amaro or the bitters sure. to the pharmacies as mild laxatives. And so they, they were able to keep some production. Exactly. Please. Under the guise of... Under the guise of pharmaceutical laxatives. And then, of course, products from Italy, food, you know, different right. goods. But that's how he survived. And then it so passed on to his boys. When was that? I, I mean, your dad, John, and your uncle. Is it Harry? Yes. Um, you know, we set up your grandfather... When did your father and uncle get into it? Did they kind of tool around and go to college and yes. do other jobs or yes. did they come no, right into my, it? No, my father went to Cornell University. Okay, he was very smart proud. Guy. Yeah. Graduated in 1954. Okay. Um, and not the hotel school, just, you know, arts and science. But um, he had kind of known that he he was the oldest son, but a middle child. He had an older sister. But he kind of knew and he would work in the warehouses and work, you know, during the summer. And people at Cornell used to call him Cecil B. DeMille because he had a wonderful creative streak. He was very smart and very loved marketing. So he would do the brochures and all the products and do it all hand design. And wow. he just had this great visionary mind. So he came into the business after he graduated in 54. Um, he did have to serve in the military for a little while after graduation. He spent time in Germany in the U.S. military. Um, Your uncle, younger or older than him? My uncle was younger. And did he eventually come in? He came into the business after university and worked with my father. So they were together pretty yes. quickly early on. Yes. Did so they get along? They did. They okay. got along wonderfully. My dad was the one who traveled and had been bringing in, because we acted as an importer to the great first gross of Burgundy and Bordeaux and Mosul well, you're kinda, and Rhine. You're kind of jumping a step. Let's go back. Okay. Um, so... We see what your grandfather did. We see where he came from. 
you know, Aunt Bonfi, um, your dad, which is pretty impressive, generationally, you know, went to college and went to a great university, mm -hmm. um, goes into the business. Um, how was your grandfather importing? Yes. Wines already? Was yes. he importing some good stuff? Yes, good okay. stuff. So by the time your dad and uncle got there, they they had a well-oiled machine of wine. Correct. Import. It was a successful little right. business. Right. I mean, small, but, and mostly French wines, more than Italian, because that's what they serviced People in New York City. People weren't drinking as much French wine then, and I'm not sure there were a ton of guys doing what, you know, your grandfather did. I mean, there are Deutsch and Cobra, you know, maybe those guys were around or whatever. Um, all right. So your dad comes in and what happens? I mean, does he put his imprint on it? I mean, where, where to think, cause things go crazy in time. He, he so, gets so, a lot of success. So, you know, walk me through yes. a lot of that. So they had been importing, you know, all these great Burgundian and, and uh, first gross of Bordeaux. And we still have them all in our cellar today, which is pretty incredible. But he said, you know, he, he was a young, ambitious man. And he's like, I couldn't get arrested a lot of times trying to sell some of these wines in New York City because he said it was just so tough. People weren't consuming wine. They were having the martinis. They were having beer. They were having spirits. And not said, even other wine. Not uh, even other, so other much wine. alcoholic beverage. Exactly. It's crazy. And I think he was just really frustrated. And um, he said, this isn't what it should be for this industry. So he actually said, well, you know, I appreciate fine wines because I grew up with them and he was an, an Italian family. But he said, let's try to find a wine that consumers will be able to enjoy more readily because they're just not in the 1950s and 60s. They just weren't considering wine. So he actually teamed up with a cooperative in Italy um, that was making a soft style wine called Lambrusco. And it was made by a cooperative, Riuniti, and he worked with them to... What year are we talking about? So we're about? talking about 1967, okay. I think. And <clears throat> so he then said, hey, let's craft this style a little bit for a consuming public who likes their Coca-Cola and iced tea sweetened and... And they brought it in. They learned how to pasteurize it and stabilize it. You know, it was a learning curve because these wines were not made for exporting. No. Um, so they had to work really hard with the winemakers. And John said, if you can, you know, give me some of this product, I can sell it for you in America. And they said, well, you know, son, can you, you know, sell you know, to 100,000 cases. And he goes, I'll tell you what, in year one. And he said, whoa, that's ambitious. You know, we weren't, wine wasn't selling that way. And he said, well, I, I'll tell you what, I can't give you 100,000 cases in the first year. But if you give me three years, I'll give you 500,000 cases. And lo and behold, he brought this in and he started clever marketing it. Really so clever. So his marketing interest and prowess. That was what Because I remember as a kid hearing, exactly. you know, radio spots. I, I can't remember the yes, jingle, but Reuniti on Ice, on ice, on ice no less. Yes. Right. And uh, Reuniti on Ice, that's nice. And that's nice, right. He worked with a really good team and they started just they hit a chord and they got it's ended up selling more wine than any imported wine in the history of america um it boomed it brought a whole new generation of wine consumers into wine because in the 70s and 80s people started drinking it so like that, hey i drink and it was in screw cap that that preceded um, Sutter White's Infidel. It did. But I mean, but that up was there with that type of story. story of so was he consumed because of the volume and the work or was he emboldened that we could do this? We're making money. Let's do other stuff. Let's what do happened? other stuff. Okay. Never rest on your laurels. Right. He's he's a workaholic and a perfectionist. He's 91 years old. He's getting the WSWA award this, uh, you know, the Wine and Spirits yep. Wholesalers America Congrats for being the that. hero of the industry. He Deserves never rests. It. So um, after that, what they decided to do was build Costello Banfi. 
And what was remarkable, Bill Castellabampi was, he said, okay, I have success as a wine importer. I want to become a wine producer. And so if you're American, right, from New York, Italian-American, the logical place would have been to go out to the West Coast, right? Well, yeah. I mean, (laughs) there's a whole curiosity and questions I have. I mean, the idea was... How do they wind up in Brunello? I mean, you made the point that that's over there. Most people go here, but over there is, you know, they've been introduced to Bordeaux and France. Why Brunello? There was nothing in Brunello. So why it was. But who pointed them to it? Sure. A good friend and a dear colleague of my father's name, Ezio Ravella. So Ezio Ravella, take a moment. We're all over the place, but it'll all come together. Ezio Ravella, I want you to tell me what he did at the time and certainly the impact he had on Bonfi Company, Mm -hmm. Brunello, and wine. So what he did at the time, he was a young visionary Italian winemaker who met my father during his time of service in Italy. He was the one who pointed John to the Lambrusco Riuniti Cooperative. So Ezio has a past where he's, so John and Ezio Become, had been communicating. Exactly. And Ezio's career had continued and to flourish, Ezio right? Ezio was a young budding enologist, yeah. and John was a young, successful marketer, wine merchant, and they paired up together, and he said, I want to do something in Italy more. My heart's there. And Ezio said, we should go to the region of Montalcino. The Andisanti makes a Brunello here, but... They were like the first, right? Yeah, they were the original, but there was like nobody there. There was probably about 10 producers. He's like, we can buy land here, and the potential is enormous. So they went over together. flush, hopefully, with a little cash from Reuniti where they could buy some property. And I'm thinking property was reasonable then? Reasonable dirt cheap. They were, you know, you could practically snatch it up for nothing. There was nothing there. What, um, how did, so... Ezio has a relationship, points him to Brunello. They go in, they buy Brunello property. Um, before we get into the property and all that, was it weird being an American? Wasn't oh. it a small market, mostly families, very insular? I mean, did you get Absolutely. crap for that? Or Yes. I mean, did people try to sabotage? Because you'll tell me later your philosophy is more about sharing and all that. But at the beginning, there wasn't. No, at the beginning, we were seen as the strangers who were coming in to change a sleepy, historic um, territory. And we were New Yorkers. small. It's not like it was this big thing and you're going to change. It but was- Edio was running it for us. Edio became our managing director and winemaker. So remember, while it's American owned, it's Italian run. So he was the 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 passion and and the person on the ground. Did people begin to realize, they were, you know, Bonfi's Edio, and yes. it's cool. So it was a team effort, and and what Edio did was do a lot of started out as research and then sharing the research with John with other winemakers. Let me, I want to get yeah. into that, but before that, a couple things. Um, the property that's there now, is that mostly what was bought then or there were acquisitions? through the, They bought this huge... No, it was three acquisitions, okay. three parcels of acquisitions. Through how many years? Through about, not that long, about, about eight years. Okay. So it's 7,100 acres today. About uh, a of contiguous third property. Of that. A third is vineyards. Okay. A uh, third is forests, hunting preserve and forests, and a third is other agricultural estate like prunes, plums, wheat, olive groves. Um, but what they did was they amassed it over three years because it wasn't a single property, so it had to be brought together, but there was land available. And then the 12th century castle that crowned it came right in the middle of that, came for sale, and that's what today is crowned Castello Bamfi. That was one of the later yes, acquisitions? correct. So the right, land came so, first. So people can sort of visualize this. Tell me about the evolution of the property. We talked about three acquisitions, the castle, um, what was there? I mean, were there a winery? Was there a winery? Was there a barrel room? Was, there was anything no planted? There were a few vineyards planted on the under the estate Pojo Alamora, which is okay. one of our Brunellos today. 
Is it P O G G I O? Poggio. Alla, A L L E, Mora. Mora. Like of the and wall. And you have so. some bottlings called that, right? Correct. And that was the actually the historic name of the 12th century castle. The, so that the was the winery hilltop. or that? Okay. Not a winery. They had vineyards that was from the original owners of the castle. And John was, my father was actually the first wine importer in America to bring a Brunello to the United States. That's also how he knew of Poggio alla Mora. Because he went as a young man to Biondi Santi and said, can you ship some wines to New York? We have some Italian restaurateurs who would like a Brunello. And wonderful Giacomo Biondi Santi said, or Franco, uh, sorry, he said, I just don't have enough to ship. You know, I, I what I make, I sell here in Europe. And so my father went down the street to the 12th century castle and knocked on the door. And it was called Poggio alla Mora. And he brought some of the bottles to New and York. And he wound up buying it? Yes, and he ended up buying that estate. Wow. So there was not a winery, though. He had to build what the winery we from talking? scratch. We're talking 1978. And there was just no Brunello, no real knowledge. Isn't that crazy? It wasn't that long ago? It wasn't that long ago. So there was knowledge of Brunello within Italy, but outside of Italy, people really didn't understand it. They knew Chianti. Right. But they knew it in the, what's that bottle in the, the basket? Fiasco, the they, they wicker the basket. Fiasco. Exactly. Right. You know, which was similar to the other wines we talked about. It goes back to Reuniti and all that. So that's when they start coming into prominence where they bring the wine. Now what happens? They start building. I'm sure there's an old Yiddish term called spilkes, which means you're restless. I'm sure Ezio was restless. And it's like, we got to build a wine, you know. So what happens as far as that? Well, it just, well, first of all, they were very restless because they didn't know what to plant there because most of it was virgin soil. So they were saying, what are we going to do? Like but they were going outside of Sangiovese yes, thought wise. Yes. Oh yes. We experimented. Weren't they with looking Cabernet, at whites Merlot, first too? Or? Pinot Grigio, which is one of our best, San Angelo. And, and the Italian DOC and government regulation said Pinot Grigio cannot be grown in Tuscany. It's never been so grown. So you mentioned three varietals. Yeah. Merlot, Capsov. Yeah. Were super Tuscans around then or starting? Not really. Just so starting. They, just that starting. That wasn't lurking where it was an influence. You nope. were just thinking independently. We were thinking this is virgin soil. The best wines in the world at the time were kind of considered the French wines. So let's, and in the Italian. Use those. You, ver- and vin- not just Pinot Grigio, but Pinot Gris from Alsace. Right. Let's try those and see how they do in Tuscany. We even pe- planted Pinot Noir to see how it would do. So we experimented with all these because we have the largest diversity of microclimate on one single estate in all of Italy because of our size and our 29 different types of soil. So we besides microclimate, you have a diversity of soils. Correct. So the most you diverse. could match. So we, because all this <laughs> research had been be- Gun with different consortios in Italy, like the Chianti Consortio, had begun experimenting with Cabernet Sauvignon. But because you had to manage it between many different estates and many different growers and coordinate the research efforts, it's a much bigger project. What happened with us is we had it all in one location. So we brought in, Ezio and my father brought in University of Milan, the University of Pisa, the University of Bordeaux, UC Davis, Every leading institution in the world and analogist came to Montalcino, to Castello Banfi, to study and to work. And they saw it as a clean palette. So that that doesn't happen organically. That happens as a way of how you want to do your business and share it. You know, you're starting out, you know, people are a little taken aback by you coming in. And here you are. Whatever we're doing, here's what we're doing. Correct. Take, you know, you brought you. Who who was the driver of that? Was that Ezio, your dad, collectively? Collectively. They both shared a very much a vision. I always call them two brothers separated. And birth. if you had to explain why they did that, what their motive was. Their motive really. Motive's a negative word. Their, no. W- w- why they wanted it. Their vision. Um, vision. Truly. It is stands today for a better wine world. They've always said that. They're like, if a single producer, if we in Montalcino make a better Brunello or can make a Pinot Grigio, it's not going to be enough 
to have not only the Italian recognition of DOC of committee recognize what's happening in Tuscany, but we need to have the whole community behind us so we can all rise. So the idea was if there's enough of an energy behind it and we get others around us to start experimenting and planting it as well, we'll have more of a voice to help kind of change and influence the Italian wine laws. So what's good for Italy the EU wine laws, and hence all consumers. So that so was really the vision. So that's not a unique concept, but it's not one that's used enough. It, unfortunately, and I think And no. it was, you know, I wouldn't say before it's time, but I mean. It was ambitious. It, it was ambitious and the right thing. Imagine if most people in most industries. Didn't share. Or, or shared, you know. Where yeah, things- and I think, you know, in the tech industry, we see that, you know, how just different and exclusive it is. In the wine yeah, industry. it's proprietary. It's pro- oh, proprietary. In the wine industry, industry, it's really not. It's based on centuries of passing down of traditions, but blending those with pioneering research. So the research covers everything? Yes. Every, you know, soil, climate, winemaking, I mean, whatever. So you start with the soil. So we did a project called Zonazione, a zonation. So you break out the different soil types into different zones. And then you move to the clonal work and you work with different clones from different nurseries and you plant those. Uh, Then you work on narrowing that down, right? 650 types. This is with the universities. This is and with all the universities. I'm sure Ezio has a crew too. Mm-hmm. 20 different leading enologists from different universities worked on the, and agronomists. So remember, it starts in the soil and then it moves up to the clones, then it moves to the vinification, then it moves to the wood. Um, we experimented with different wood. So if you think about it, it's it's a really concerted effort between the every step of the way, every engineer, every agronomist, and every uh, vid, you know winemaker, enologist. It's it's it, it's amazing. Um, so I think the region is you know much better. I mean, did your dad and Ezio observe other regions doing that, or nobody had time to look at that? I mean, do we think that yes. was going on in Bordeaux? I think that or, was going on in Napa, uh, kind of starting. Yeah, because when you start that early and everything. I think they started seeing it happening in Chile. My EGO had gone down to um, Chile to host a tasting. And he said to my father in 1980, he said, you have to go down there and meet the people from Country Toro. And they're doing wines and research. So it was going on. You just had to know where to look. It wasn't out in the open. Um. Tell me this, because I came across it. Did did your dad initially stumble into Piedmont first? Yes. Before Brunello? Very good. Did, did, are you there? Did you stay there? I mean, did you, I, I mean, the project we're talking about, Costello Bonfi is very ambitious. What was, hap- what was happening? So Piedmont was our first foray, actually, into Italy in 19... 19- was that without knowing... You know, Brunello's kind Correct. of have, so you got there and then Brunello Correct. popped up. So, so we worked with Edio. Edio was Piedmontese. Oh, he was, he was. Okay, and so we wanted it for the sparkling wines. And uh, because remember, we had known Lambrusco was successful. So, oh, up in right. Piedmont, we do predominantly sparkling spumante as well as agave. So, we are very successful today with our Rose Regale, Burketto Dacui, a red sparkling. So, that's where we started because that's kind of what we knew. And then we saw this opportunity come up in so Tuscany. So, when if, if you and I talk to our friends and you say Piedmont, They'll say three things, Barolo, Barbaresco, and truffles. Mm. Was that, was Barolo and Barbaresco fledgling then or established? Uh, Because when you got to Brunello, it was fledgling. Yes. Because admittedly, as a region, you you know, you think of Tuscany, Brunello. Correct. I think there was more opportunity. Um, Barolo, as you know, is a very different um, footprint, very small estates, much more Burgundian in that style. Very much. So I think what they saw is Barolo was classic, just like Brunello. Barolo was starting to get attention thanks to Angelo Gaia, Piero Antonori, the super tussle, my father. They're all the same age. You know, they're all about 
they are 80s into my what father's a generation. 90s, but that was that generation. Yeah. I think what brought them to Montalcino was the warmer Tuscan sun and the climate, as well as the opportunity to get more land because the parcels could right. be bigger. The way it was set up. Exactly. Are you still in Pamonte? You still are. Making... I was just there last week. Okay. We we are not in Barolo, unfortunately. I wish we were, but we do make a Barbera d'Asti because we're just outside of Asti. Right. And we have a winery in um, Nobi Liguri, which is where we make our Gavi from the Cortese grape, and a small uh, sparkling wine and red wine facility in Strevi, near Osti. Sure. What's interesting is you had your exposure to Bordeaux and Burgundy, you know, as an importer and, you know, Barolo kind of fits in those categories. Um, and when you got wine. there for all the right reasons, you chose to go in another direction. Um, Christina, we have to take a quick break um, so we could talk about our sponsors and underwriters. When we come back, I want to talk to you about your role, what you're doing, and I want to get into the winery and philosophy and all that other stuff. We're talking to Christina Mariani May from Bonfi. Um, you're listening to The Grape Nation. We'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Roberta's was founded in Bushwick in 2008 and has become one of the most iconic restaurants in the country. HRN made its home inside of Roberta's in 2009, and together they have become part of the DIY fabric of the neighborhood. Roberta's, the pizza restaurant, is open for lunch and dinner seven days a week and serves much more than just the famous wood-fired pizzas. Their team dreams up new salads, pastas, and sandwiches on the regular. Roberta's Tiki Bar is alive and well in the back garden, serving up frozen drinks in the summer and hot toddies in the winter. Stop by the bakery and takeout spot next door for fresh breads, sticky buns, and pizzas to go. But Roberta's also extends beyond Bushwick, with multiple locations in New York City and now in Los Angeles. You can also find their frozen pies in grocery stores around the country. The spirit of Roberta's, like Heritage Radio Network, is everywhere. Here's to many more years of pizza-powered radio. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Okay, we're back. We're back with my guest, Christina Mariani May. Christina is the president and CEO of Bonfi, and you have a little taste of where they are, what they're doing, how big they are, and we'll get into that a little more. Um, I'm curious, I th we'll talk about it. You joined the family business in the 90s. What were you doing before you came to work for your dad? Did you tool around a little? I did. Not quite as much. Um, so I attended Georgetown University. Okay. You got to um, kept the tradition of going to good colleges. Good. And, and I loved it. And I actually just got off uh, teaching a master's yeah, Lauren class told at me, Georgetown. Yeah, that's right. Which your was. dad did and you're carrying that torch. Exactly. Education is key. Yeah, Sharing cool. information, educating new generation. So during that time, I lived in Florence for a year and fell in love again. Did you do a semester abroad? And exactly. That's how you, and then you stayed? No. Well, then I stayed over the summer, but then okay. I had to come back to finish up my senior year. Okay. And um, I did not stay. You know, I graduated. But after that, I just knew that I wanted to be in the wine business. I fell madly in love. Before that, I had worked at different you know, kind of restaurants. I worked on Capitol Hill for a congressman. I had worked in a different marketing office, but nothing pulled me. And then when I spent that whole time in Italy and with the winery and with the Italians, I thought this is the life I want to choose for myself. So how much time back. transpired between the end of college and when you started? Sure. So I graduated from college and about a year later, I came to work for the business. Oh, wow. So was... soon after. And I was, I have to admit, my father wanted me right away because he was an older father, you know, age wise. He wanted me to come in and learn underneath him, where I think today, in retrospect, I would send my kids out to work for a longer period of time for Different somebody circumstance. else. Different circumstances. Different circumstances. Because when Lauren told me how old your dad was, and I know how old you are, but yeah. 
there's a spread. I'm like, your dad had you when he was older. Yes, and he- So that was more critical to experience. And in retrospect, I think it was. I got my education from watching him and he's really unique and passionate and very driven and very hardworking, very demanding. So it was not easy, you know? Yeah. Um, well, stay on that not easy part because yeah. I want to ask you this. Um, in the past decade, maybe a little less, a little more, women have taken on more important roles in wine, um, running them, winemakers. And, you know, that wasn't a given, you know, that long ago. Was being a woman in the industry, and I understand you're in a family business and your dad certainly was your protector, was being a woman in the industry in Italy is different than the U.S. as far as how they perceive women and Americans and all that. Was there ever any disadvantage to you or the company being a woman, a woman as far as advancing your efforts or vision? Well, when I first came in to the business, I was very insecure and particularly insecure of what? Insecure being inexperience a young, is one thing. Inexperience, but insecure being a woman in a US industry that was all men in suits in the distributor side as an importer. So that's internal. Yes. What about external? Externally, I wanted, I craved the credibility and I craved experience that would really kind of only come with time. So what I did do for myself, as if, as if I'm speaking to other women coming into the business, I went back and got a business degree, which I did not have a business degree undergraduate. So I went back to Columbia and got an MBA. And that- Was that- was that because what you could do and learn would be helpful or you just needed it for show? Really? But you got some I got – well, I learned a lot. Don't get yeah, me wrong. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but the I reason taken was – business classes at undergraduate. Right. So the reason was I wanted to be seen as being more credible and and have more on my resume that would be – impressive because I felt as a young woman, I needed more to stand up and be recognized in a room of more senior men and in a very different time, time, lifestyle situation in the industry where there was a lot of partying and drinking and spirits. And, you know, it wasn't my comfort zone no, at all. So I did not I did not gravitate towards that part. What it did get me to do, which I am very grateful today, is I gravitated towards the winemaking portion because that's the art and the culture and the passion. So I ended up spending a bit more time in Italy at the winery. Which than took I you did, away from other things. Than I did in but the But was as important as Just anything. as important. We run right. two businesses. So stay there for a okay. second because um, – let, let's talk about that. In 2018, and correct me if I'm wrong, you ascended to president and CEO. Correct. Well, I guess your dad thought, Christina, you're ready. It's time. Um, I think we were just talking about it. But previous to 2018, what were your responsibilities? I mean, were they firmly defined? I mean, was it winemaking or was it a little of everything? It was managing the team in Italy and it was more of the marketing and PR. Okay. Were you living in Italy or just back and forth? Back and forth, but okay. with young children. I was just going to say, what year was that? How old were you and did you have kids? I did have kids. I had babies um, who are now 20, 18, and 16. <laughs> so it was uh, exhausting. It was hard. See... <laughs> Being a woman in business, being a woman in an industry that's predominantly driven by men, being a mom, being held to the same standards, there's nothing harder. And then you do it by country, you know, back and forth. Um, did you ever lose faith in continuing to do that or it's not worth it or my kids are – what happens there? What happened – Definitely. <laughs> yeah, a lot. <laughs> right. Um, what happened would be spells. I think it still happens in life, right? We go through spells sure. where we don't know what we're doing. We're uncertain. I have to say what saved me and got me through it was I'm a big runner and I love distance running. Um, I love the time in my head to think. And whenever 
I would get lost or confused or scared or just want to quit. I would go for a long run. I would run a marathon. I'm a big marathoner. That would clear you? It would clear me. It would get it out of my system and it would make me nervous to do it. And then I'd have a release. And after that release, I'd say, okay, what are my alternatives? I can stay at home and raise my children, which would be wonderful. But then what? Right? They leave. You wouldn't be satisfied. I won't be satisfied. So I'm really so proud today, Sam, because my kids had a role model in me, especially my daughter. Sure. Um, and my sons as well, a woman. Yeah, I mean, and maybe you gravitate towards your daughter first. But, correct. But the boys but, now yeah. see women yeah. as, you know, just as equal and they're so proud. And so it was all worth it. But you just can't see that in the time when you're exhausted no. and your heart's breaking when you have to kiss them goodbye again. No. And leave on another airplane. You so know? you were able to tough that out and you give a lot of credit to running, which fin- physically and mentally Help, saved me. I mean, your body releases endorphins and all kinds of stuff and everything. I mean, that's pretty cool. And you're still an avid runner. You yeah. run marathons and all that. But I think you just have to find something as an outlet, you know? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> thank God. And that's a good one because... There can be others you can that are drink, not as <laughs> get high all the time. I mean, that's not going to help anybody. All right, so now let's talk about 2018 on. Um, your responsibilities are as president and CEO, which obviously is to take over for your dad. And you work side by side with him. And you had an idea of how he ran the business for years. You get in there, and I don't sense there's any disrespect to your dad or turning things upside down, but what do you want to do when you get there? So what I want to do is really continue to grow this business for a better wine world. And what I'm saying, I know that sounds like our our motivation, it is our mission. What I want to do is get more and more people from this new generation into wine. Same thing my father was doing with just the different tactics in today's day and age. Did you have any siblings? Do you have a brother or anything? I have a sister, but she's not in the business. I used to have cousins, but they exited the business. They didn't want to be in it anymore. No. So, um, I did have other family members in the business with me up until 2018. Okay. They exited. All right, you fired them all. Go ahead. Um, and <laughs> no, 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 not quite. Go ahead. They're happy. Go, I know. Um, so yes. So the vision, you know, more and more, it's not just about wine. It's about the experience. Okay. Building up the experience of what Tuscany and Italy is from a hospitality standpoint is very important to me. So we have to continue to craft outstanding wines at affordable luxury, but the hotel, the make hospitality, it, a destination. it already is. And we've got to make it better and bigger. In that sense. So the question I asked you, the things you started doing when you came in, was there much of that there? I think there there was. was, Oh, yes. I think Tuscany's done a good job. Oh, Tuscany's done a wonderful job. But you felt for your vision and Pompey's that you needed to. Correct. More. And then in the U.S. side, we premiumized our portfolio. So we took a big leap of faith um, before the pandemic when I came in and we got out of the business of the Riuniti and the volume wines and refocused our business. Importation mostly? Importation. Wait, so Riuniti was still in the portfolio and still a decent amount of bottles? Yes, and it was an important revenue stream for the company that was kind of still built around it. So we had to rework the model. So were there a bunch of other brands, too, that were fairly successful? So this is you. This is Christina. I got to get my sights off of this so I can put it on other things. We'll get out of that business. And it worked. Because the t- then the pandemic You're spending came. more time on that and not Focus. enough. Focus. It's not a bigger portfolio. It's not doing more things. It's doing the things you do well better. Okay. That is the discipline that I try to bring to it. And it is about the people. So let's talk finances. Sure. I mean, do you take, forget the numbers specifically. Yeah. Do you take a big hit initially that you calculate when you get rid of, you know, that importation or you're excited that, okay, we could deal with that and we'll, well build. We're excited. Uh, we took, we took a deal to get out of it. Right. So there's you not. You kind of sold it off. To some, yes. Yeah. And, you got something in exchange. Business wise, I used it to 
exit some other family members who didn't want to be in the business anymore because that's what happens with third generation. Right. You know, that's right. to me, that's been my greatest effort is preserving family ownership through third generation, which right. is the toughest one. I mean, that's one. the DNA of what So that, this I kind of did a dual. When was that shedding? 2018. It was right away yep. you got in. So as soon as I became CEO, that's what I did. Is that something you and your dad talked about? Something yes, Something that course. was lurking in the back of your of mind? Course. But it was so a bold you... move because it was a big move for our company. Right. It worked in our favor. So five years later. It worked. It was the right move because uh, of where you want to focus. Um, all right. So let's keep moving and let's talk about what we talked about. Um, before, um, which is winemaking, farming, and all of that stuff, which I'm glad to hear from your prompt that you were very much in touch with it and very much involved. Um, so let's talk about winemaking, farming, sustainability. Okay. I'm a big sustainability guy. What, how do you define sustainability? And how is it applied there? Just smaller bottles and packing up cardboard doesn't check. Tell me what you're doing. So what we're doing many. By things. the way, smaller bottles is a big deal. No, you were I doing agree. It a long time, but I agree. I think everything's a bit, it all adds up, right? The most important way I'll begin is to say that we don't want to over cultivate our land. We need to protect our ratio of cultivated to uncultivated to forests. Because one of the th ways we can protect is by allowing the soil, the terroir, the earth in our territory to regenerate. So only one third of our estate is planted to is cultivated. Um, one third to vines, as I said, a so lot of it. So it's a whole eco culture. Exactly. Just, right. So I think maintaining that is key. I think that it's not only, you know, in sustainable farming where you're using everything natural in the vineyards, where you, you know, we put in solar paneling for energy, where we have wastewater that's all protective. We have our own reservoirs. We have seven reservoirs on our property so we can use our own rainwater and natural rainwater, not drain it from the rivers. Um, but also don't forget sustainability is about the community. It's about the society you live and employees in. employees. And our employees. Your culture. So the culture around you. Exactly. So that's what we're most proud of. I mean, we have the Equalitas, the first winery in Italy to receive this Equalitas certification for really exceptional environmental, social, and ethical responsibility. And that's where I think it's more important to protect our workers, to share our research, to give back to the community. Today, Montalcino as a town is one of the wealthiest hilltop towns in all of Tuscany. The community has over 260 producers. It's outgrown. It's, it's thriving, it's, per it's se. It's the most valuable vineyard real estate in all of Italy, that really? territory. So it went from being one of the poorest when we came in, and today is the highest value. So we've bought, brought jobs. We've brought a community to life. We've brought, you know, um, yeah, a renaissance, really. So, and I say that in a good way because we're all well, yeah, sharing in it. But based on what we discussed, you had a hand in that. Yes, but and you know. we're all sharing in the success. So let me ask you a question. I hope it's not uncomfortable. When you get down to the vineyard and the soil and all that, based on how much property you have and maybe the climate and all that, do you have to apply treatments to the vineyards? No, no. I mean, in a sense, are you organic or no, organic we are, practice? We are organic practice. Okay. To be, as you know, Sam, certified organic in yeah. the EU is very rigorous and administratively right. demanding, but we are organically farming it. Right. We just, it, that's why we say sustainable. I mean, I have a quote here. I think it was from your dad. He had a vision of pure and natural winemaking from the beginning. That's why we started so that from scratch are, as a winery. So even, you know, there are stories of famous wineries in Europe that right after World War II had to treat everything for vitamin and all, and whatever, you know, yeah. to get, I, I mean, your dad obviously never believed in that and the vineyards, you know, were never, um, you know, which is a nice thing for something that long. And Sam, just to, to 
tying it back to our history, that's why we built a winery from scratch. He didn't want to inherit that tradition or mistakes from past we'll generations have to fix it. of winemakers and then have to fix it. Right. It's harder. So it's almost easier to do it right from the beginning. That's an interesting point because you're talking about a time where he had this vision, you know, of pure and clean, you know, farming and all of that. That was a long time ago. I mean, science and how you could do things have evolved. I'm, I'm sure that things have been updated and all of that, or what's old is new is good. I mean, you know, you have to keep reinvesting in the winery size and all that. I mean, do you? Technology research. One example that you bring is we have these fermenters that we patented at Banfi that are half stainless steel, half wood. And so the cap How does the that base, work? Is half of it on the bottom? So the stainless is on the bottom and the top, and the sides are all That's French oak. So, so that gives you a mixture? Correct. It's just not steel fermentation and not wood? It, it's Instead of doing it in separate, you... So it's the new old-fashioned way. Right. So old-fashioned to ferment in wood was to give the softest texture to the wine, especially a Sangiovese that has harsh tannins. But it was hard to clean, hard to maintain. It could build up a lot of bacteria. So we worked with the engineers to patent a silicon gasket that expands and contracts to do with the top of the stainless steels. Because the problem was you couldn't merge the breathable wood with the inert stainless ah. and not get a perfect seal. So the oxygen would come in. We film. They form this silicon gasket that expands and contracts, keeps the oxygen out, keeps it inert. Hence, you can use the best of both worlds. So the new technology based on an old model. So that's an innovation. As I asked about your farming practices, let's talk about winemaking. You know, you have a revered brand. You make a lot of bottles. You have the name recognition. Um, does it become formulaic? I mean, does last year's wine have to taste like this year's? Because you and I know how much a vintage, whether it's weather, frost, can affect it. So talk to me about winemaking as far as, I mean, are you doing a lot of treatments or whatever? Or So wine, as you know, changes every year. We try to keep it as consistent <clears throat> as possible. Um when you see our single vineyards, I just got back from Rome last week and we did a vertical of our Poggio Allora Brunello Reserva over 10 vintages. So wow. back to 1985. Um, and it's only produced in exceptional years, but the wine changed completely between yeah. all the different vintages. What we try to do is maintain the best expression of the vintage. Now, we are in a wonderful place in Montalcino because we have so many single vineyards on our property. We can classify, declassify, blend the different Sangiovese if it's not from a single vineyard in order to capture the best quality of that vintage. I think the challenge that exists at smaller estates, and we have smaller estates ourselves in Bulgari and Marema, is that if you cannot declassify to a Rosso di Montalcino or an IGT Toscana and blend the wines, what happens to a territory of challenge is that they feel obligated to produce a certain amount of Brunello every year. Because if they don't, they don't have other right. wine or labels to put the wine in. Right. At Banffy, we're very fortunate. We have Super Tuscan labels. We have IGT labels. We're the largest producer of Rosso di Montalcino. So we can declassify in order to maintain our standards. Which means the wine is what it is and you don't have to do anything to no, bring it up. Me, and, not. and we might produce less yeah, if it's no, a weaker vintage, but we don't. That's where size kind of helps and matters. Diversity matters. That's exactly. great. I, I mean, um, so you said you're one of the, you're the largest Rosso mm -hmm. producer? Mm -hmm. um, By far. That's amazing. Um, so you make. Dozens of wines. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to sit here and, you know, talk about every wine. But let's, you know, categorize. I mean, Castello Bonfi is known for their Brunello. Obviously, there's a lot of Rosso, Chianti. Um, then tell me what else is after that. We, uh, we talked about Pamonte Sparklers, which yep. we'll, you know, we'll rehash that again. But The Whites. 
Okay. And the whites are? Pinot Grigio called San Angelo. It's the only 100% Tuscan Pinot Grigio. Okay. Which here in the States, what I love. What does Tuscany impart in a Pinot Grigio? I'm not a big Pinot Grigio fan. It's like fizzy water with lemon juice. Not this one. But, That's right. why you have to so taste what it. Is, t- is it the soil, the, the climate, warmth, the, the climate, wine? It's warmer, much warmer, less acidity in the wine. So normally Pinot Grigio comes from the north up by, you know, the yeah, yeah. J, Venice. Um, so you're getting higher acidity, which some of them can be beautiful. Some of them could taste like water, yeah. you know, in today's day and age. When you come down to Tuscany, because the, we're, the, the vineyards are in the valley, it gets very warm. I mean, we're just north of Rome. So you're getting more tropical fruit and a lot more natural fruit sweetness. So you're getting an interesting acidity, profile. Really different profile, richer profile. Do you make a decent amount of that? Oh, or? yes. Okay, so yes. that's a... We're very proud of that wine. Okay, tell me what else. Other whites? A Vermentino. Okay, which I love. I love Vermentino. So our La Pategola Banfi Vermentino. That's my summer wine, Vermentino. Oh. Oh, it's to me, it's and where ideal. is that made in Tuscany, too? Or? That's made in Montalcino in our okay. state. Um, we have a few vineyards in the Marema along the coast, but right. most of it's from Montalcino on okay. our property. Um, let's see, what else do we make? Um, we make a Chardonnay that is just beautiful, Fontanelle Chardonnay. Um, Tuscan Chardonnay. Tuscan Chardonnay. We also make, uh, you know, our IGT Super Tuscans with Merlot, Syrah, Cabernet. What is that called? I forgot the so name. So we have a one four called letter cum name. laude, another oh, cum- sumus, and another excelsis, all Latin That's names. That's right. Those are the Super Tuscans? Those are the Super Tuscans. Those are the, the Cab Merlot. Cab Merlot always with a touch of Sangiovese. Right. Which most people don't put a touch of Sangiovese. Even. No, our Excelsis does not, but Sumis and Cum Laude okay. do, which makes it distinguishable for having a home in Tuscany. Um, and then in Piemonte, we talked about how you opted to make sparklers. Um, how many different skews are you making in Piemonte? Sparkling? Uh, we make about eight different sparkling wow. wines. We don't bring them all to America. Um, but they are both um, Method Champenoise, a beautiful DOC um, called Alta Langa, which is up there in Piedmont. Right. And we make that with our Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Uh, Alta Langa is just gorgeous. And then we do some like our Rose Regali and the Charmant Method. What What is the Rose Regali? It's got a nice deep hue. What are the grapes in there? So the uh, the red sparkling of Rosa Regali is 100% Brachetto grape uh-huh. from the town of <coughs> Acqui, Acqui Terme. Okay. So Brachetto d'Acqui, and it must be. It's a DOCG. Ah. But it's sweet. Because we stopped color. the fermentation short. All right. Let me ask you a speed round of questions. Um, what wine do you think you're the most well known for? The Brunello. Okay. Uh, just the plain Brunello. Our classic Brunello Yeah, I mean, normale. people will wait for the si. Reserva or si. whatever. Um, what's the best-selling wine? That in volume? It, yeah. In volume, it's probably our Chianti Classico Reserva. Okay, and that's the Bonfi. The Bonfi, okay. yeah. Um, so there's Bonfi Chianti Classico, Chianti Classico Reserva. Mm-hmm. Is there another Chianti? There Just is straight up. Chianti Superiore. Is that the cheapest? Not cheapest, uh, the no, least. The, ex- the, yes, the Superiore okay. is a lesser in price because it's not from the designated zone. Okay. Um, last question in this vein is since you've been at the helm, what's the wine you're the most proud of? Oh, is it something you developed, you changed, or it's just the classic Bonfi thing that you're proud of? Um, I think it's probably our Brunello called Poggio alla Mora, which is a selection of the best crews of the Brunellos, the best vineyards. And it's the first result of all of our years of clonal research and maximizes all of our knowledge and our research. And we put it into our finest bottling of Brunello. So there's a lot there to unpack. Yeah. There's a lot of history there because that was one of the, that's the estate with the castle. Yes. Okay. Um, the application of science, you know, and all of that clonal science. Um, and are you saying the best lots? Yes. Like where yes. this is great, great. And you'll do all of that. Um, so is it fair to say that's the best Bonfi Brunello? Yes. Okay. So you should be proud of that. Yes. All right. Um, 
All right, listen, we do a thing called the wine list. We don't let anybody go home, go to bed, or go back to their office without answering the wine list. And I've done upwards of 300 interviews and asked everyone these same five questions. So you got to answer them. Uh, don't obsess on the answers. Be spontaneous. I post these answers. You know, after listening to this interview, people love to hear, you know, what you're eating and drinking and all that. All right, so the first question, what are you drinking now? What's in the fridge? What are you exploring? Did the change of seasons move you around? Could be beer. I don't know. I'm <coughs> drinking a lot of our Principessa Gavi Agave. Why? Fresh, light, tropical fruit. Just stylistically, stylistically that's what you want like and it. you love what you're making. Yes. Do you go outside of Bonfi ever? Of course. So what else do you like? Champagne. <laughs> Okay, you and me, babe. I mean, to me, that's the most underappreciated. Champagne. Okay. Um, I do. I love, uh, if I'm also going outside, Vino Verde. I, I kind of am into the white wines right now, being a little lighter and fresher. Um, so I'm a wine collector. Yep. I have a cellar. Every, you know, people say, okay, I'll bring wine. I said, no, 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 I don't want to drink your crappy wine. I'll bring the wine. So... In the past few years, instead of bringing a white and a red, I bring a champagne and a red. Because what doesn't champagne go with? And when you got to eat a lot, a lot of the first courses are seafood, shellfish, or whatever. So it goes, and everyone's like, this is amazing, you know. So champagne is a cool thing. All right, so good answers there. Quick, decisive. I like where this is going. This is the goofiest question of the five. Your favorite wine and food pairing. Not what you think a good one is. And I assume, you know, like all of us, we don't eat it every month, every, you know. What's what's that ooh-ah? For me. You. For me, it's sitting at the Tuscan coast okay. in the summer with my family, with the Vermentino. And? A beautiful, probably Corvina, like a sea bass. Okay. Okay. Like Corvina, the fish is the like fish. a sea bass. It's like a sea bass. Okay. That comes right from the sea. They just grill it simply with the oregano and the olive oil. And they put it on. It has a lemon on the side. And you've got the patate frite, the little salty fried potatoes on the side. And I'm just enjoying the richness of the Pategola Vermentino, which is a beautiful, richer white. I was just going to say, is it a little richer yes. than most? Yes. So it could hold up to the fish, to the, fish. the oil from the potato. That is what I, you asked me my personal. No, that's, a, that's the answer. But that's, I mean, that's where I'm happy. That That's a perfect and answer. And chocolate and rose vergali, but that's a different, that's okay. a different. So that's a good pairing? Oh my gosh, okay. the best. Wait, is this the Rose this Regali? This is the Rose Regali with, with ch like chocolate, raspberry, like ganache or something. Okay. So a dessert, a, a dessert. cake that yes. has is like a Any berries, flourless red berry. chocolate cake with a uh, reduced raspberry sauce. Yes. This is killer. This is it because it okay. has high acidity. Cuts right through it. All right. Now, I don't know how much you get out. I know you have kids. I know you're busier than hell. Um, and I know you're in Italy and somewhat sequestered in Long Island, but try to answer this question. Favorite wine restaurant and or bar? And when you answer that anywhere, when you answer this, you're not being exclusive. Like you're going to bump into a friend and they go, how come you didn't mention me? It's not about who's the best. Who? Here's the setup. Who? It could be a bar. It could be a restaurant. Who has a great wine program? Who has a knowledge of it? Um, who has the vibe? Okay, I'm going to say this just because it was the most recent, but I'm going to say La Pergola Restaurant in Rome. Okay. It's a three-star Michelin. So, so it's a fancy place. It's fancy. Their wine list, you can only imagine. Is, lives up to the hype of being a three-star? Yes, in every sense. Okay. So from all the different regions, I would say that. And then on top of it, the view is up on the hillside of Rome overlooks the entire is it a city of Rome. freestanding restaurant no, or it's part, part of a of hotel? A hotel the Waldorf Astoria okay. hotel and the restaurant's the view the restaurant and it is ain't on a hotel terrace. restaurant no it's a great it's a separate three star okay. the view there with a wine list where you just say to the sommelier bring me something unique something new leave it to them leave it to them all right before we exit this question 
can you give me something in Long Island or New York? Ah, that would be your next question. Uh, absolutely. Um, and the context is these are wine places. No, 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 no. You know, you heard who Christina is. Here's places she thinks are good wine places. Absolutely. If they exist. Well, of course they exist. Okay, then give me one that you're comfortable with. Um, I'll do one in Long Island just because I haven't That's been in the city in a little while um, only because I'm traveling all the time. I spend more time <coughs> abroad than here. Um, I really like uh, a beautiful wine list, Hendrix Tavern, which is fun. I've never heard Roslyn. of it. Roslyn? Great wine list. So North Shore, we're yep, on the North yep. Shore. Old, like tavern. That's great. a first. I'm glad to yep. present that one. It's, it's a really nice. Um, to present it. Also, Brass Rail in um, Locust Valley is a nice one. Another good one. Very classic. Yeah, really so good. So Hendrix Tavern has a lot of posters of Jimi Hendrix? It, no, no, you think yeah, it's more like a, a British pub. No, I know. So yeah. I have to say, there's so many now. I mean, the one thing I look for wine lists, just to, let's have some diversity on That's it. all. Like you know, curated just diversity. Interesting. From every region. I'm with you on that. You those, know, those don't will, bore me with just those will, Italy, And you France, know how to be bored. California. All right, those are all great answers. And like I said, I'll post them. Fourth question, penultimate. Um, favorite all-time wine? I used to ask that. <clears throat> What's the most expensive, <clears throat> well-known wine Christina ever drank? It's not that anymore. Mm. What's the wine that had the most influence that was awakening to you? Mm. Um, important. Sumas. And it is one of ours. And I'll say it because... So there had to be a time or a was. reason you drunk, drank it and it meant something. It did. Uh, <coughs> it was a new, at the time it was a new IGT Toscana. It's Sangiovese Cabernet Syrah. It is absolutely stunning. And it was when I it's first- It's always those three grapes? Always those three grapes in different percentages. What's the percentages. predominant blend usually? Uh, predominantly like about 40% 40, 40 <clears throat> Sangiovese, 40 Cab, 20 okay. Syrah. Syrah is beautiful. Okay. I was just kind of really establishing myself in my career. And we went out on tour. I did around the world almost presenting this wine. So it became very close to when me. When was this? This was in 1996 vintage. So it was 1999. Okay. About, I had just graduated from Columbia so Business School. So that's an school. important wine to you. Yes. That and it was my wedding year. I graduated right. from business school and I so, went all around to present this wine, which really was the first super Tuscan wine we could produce from our vineyards that wasn't just Sangiovese. So right. it was the Cabernet Syrah and the too. Syrah, which is beautiful yeah. from Tuscany. So that so wasn't hard to me. answer. No. No. So that's really, that's what the question is. All right. Last question. The question is best wine around 15, 20, 22 bucks. I want you to recommend a red and a white. I'm going to make it easy for you. Okay. Bonfi is big enough and diverse that mm -hmm. we could live in that universe and oh, answer okay. it with that. First, not to embarrass you, do we have wines in that price? Oh, point? yes. Right. Very important. So what are... Chentenay. Chentenay for every day. <clears throat> Chentenay. C-E-N-T-I-N-E. Oh, Chentenay. So it looks like Centene. Right. I thought it was Chendani. Yeah, no. yeah. Centenay is what? Is a uh, red, white, and rosé, but the red is a cuvee of Sangiovese, Merlot, and Cab. It's about twelve dollars a bottle. It is constantly rated in every so it's wine. It's a mini spectator. super Tuscan blend. As a mini super Tuscan, the, it gets the best value from Tuscany every year from one spectator. It is delicious. So it's a great value wine. Delicious. Great quality. It has a screw cap. It's a great value. It's all the great wines from Montalcino. It's fantastic. You know what I didn't ask you early on when you we talked about the vineyard, 7,000 acres, 2,000 planted. What are the age of some of the uh, vines out there? Oh, up there? to about 50 years. I mean, you have to replant stuff. Yes. You the, plant, the but there are... The lifespan's on average about 30 years. Okay. Some go back to 50, which is our single vineyard, Podra Loro. Otherwise, we replant from Esca, the wood disease. That's what seems That's to what take. That's what you're up against? Yes. Not phylloxera or any nope. of that other stuff? All right, so you answered the red, mm -hmm. great value wine in white. <laughs> I'm going to say the same wine. It has a Chantine Chantine white. Chantine yes, it's white. it's a Pinot Grigio. 100%? Yes, 100% Tuscan Pinot Grigio for about $12. Oh, my friends always ask me, oh. 
So good. You know, they're like, I'm embarrassed to tell you I love Pinot Grigio. You know wine. What should I drink? I'm like, don't drink that, but I'll tell them but to drink. But it has flavor I'll and tell character. Them to drink it's Chantine. not watery. It's not thin. I will tell them to drink yes. the Chantine. All right. You did a incredible job on that. All great answers. Um, I will post them. We're going to wrap up. But before we wrap up, we do a feature called the Weekly Wine Sip. All right. <clears throat> Every week we taste a different wine with a winemaker, and you brought out three wines, but we can only get to one. So I think we should try the Bonfi, the Wheelhouse, Brunello di Montalcino. We talked about the Regali a little, and even we'll talk, yeah. we'll talk about the Vermentino. All right, so tell me a little about this Brunello. It's the one that has come to the market, right? Correct. This is the 2017 Banfi Brunello. Um, really just an outstanding vintage. Wait, was 17 a good vintage? It was good. It was good. 16, 15 and 16 were, were awesome. top. 17 was very good. What's very the good. tough one? 18 or was it 17? 18. Okay. So then you're happy with the vintage so we're happy year. With 18, this 18. We'll talk about that another next time. Next year and it was a little tough. All right. So happy with the vintage. Any, um, discussion of the vintage? Warm, hot, rainy, perfect? Uh, warm. <clears throat> Warm, very warm good? throughout. That can be good, but we have reservoirs of water so we can irrigate our vineyards, which is good. What I, I pick up kind of on this is... Let's do nose. Let, we'll, yeah. Well, do let's do? do sight first. Okay. So it's kind of a... It's it's kind of a deep, you know, reddish. It's not this dark brooding wine. It's, you know, kind of a classic Brunello. Some of them are, you know, a little deeper. Um, so that's the color. Beautiful color. On the nose, I suck at descriptors. You tell me what you get on the nose. I mean, I'm getting deeper berry fruit, like woodsy, cassis, dark cherry. I'm getting reds and dark. Mm -hmm. A little bit of cedar and, and you know, definitely a little bit of that woodsiness is coming through with the vanillin. Yes, I get that on the, um, the aftertaste. All right, mm -hmm. mouthfeel is like a medium, medium plus. It is not this heavy, cloying wine at all. It's not thin. It's got energy. Yeah, it's got a lot of energy in the mouth. Which is what I love about, you know, there's acidity, there's tannins, there's verb. It's like lively. It dances on your palate. It does. Sangiovese. So let's talk about the palate. Does the palate descriptors um, mirror the nose descriptors? What do you get on the palate? I get a lot more vibrant fresh fruit on the palate. It's very fresh. The fruit is very This wine is young still. Way. Yeah. Um, so this is just like the new release of 2017. I'm getting a lot of vibrant tannins, um, salinity a bit coming through. I like the salinity. And it's I do not too. overpowering, it's, but it's present. But it's there. It's making yeah. your mouth water. Yeah. Um, you can feel it. And that's kind of, you know, what's typical of our Sangiovese in the area. So I'm getting that salinity, some... Nice wood, gentle wood, but it's fresh. The wood is there. Yeah, it's the the wood is not but prominent it's not, where it's it's. And I'm getting a great length, but what I'm getting is a lot of energy in this glass. Like it definitely would require food, I think. Because, All right, so we're gonna get to yeah. that. Okay. So here, I'm curious. I'm curious about wine and food pairing for this wine, yeah. but so have you made wines where you go, oh, can't drink this right now. Definitely sure. needs time. Sure. Who doesn't? Is Right. I mean, it's not a <laughs> bad <be> thing. <laughs> uh, is this a wine that's readily drinkable, do you think? I know it will benefit from age. Is this, would you Would you advise people to put I would it down? advise people to open it up and let it rest <clears throat> with the cork open <clears throat> if you're having it for dinner. Open okay. it a few hours But I'm before. going backwards. Should they lay it down for two years? Yes. Or? Ideally, you can lay it down. If, but you, if I, you're patient, it'll drink even better. If you're patient with Brunello, but it's drinkable now. And a lot of Barolos, Brunellos, they always get better with age. I think Brunello drinkers know that they always get better with time age, and they're highly ageable. Yeah, but they're also drinkable now. But I would open it before earlier. You would decant it and decant it, get or at least open, get some oxygen in it to open up because they, okay. they they come alive in the glass just after a little time. All right, now let's get to the wine and food pairing. Forget your wine and food pairing. What's the perfect wine, food, and pairing for Brunello and what?
what with this? Mm, there's a few. Bistecca Fiorentina. Okay. Simple. Which always has to be rare, right? Rare steak, lots of salt. So okay. the salt, the meat, the proteins. This I'm loving proteins. that. I'm loving a beautiful ragu with a pasta. Maybe it would be in, in Tuscany. We do have the cinghiale. A which meat is ragu? A meat ragu. Okay. Which is, you know, seat, stewed. Yeah, yeah it's um, meat. It's a thick sauce. Exactly. Those. You pair to the sauce, not to the pasta. You pair to the sauce. So that heavier stewed sauce. I would definitely. And then, of course, very typical. I'm not a big eater of lamb, but lamb, which is would any, go well, would go a really well. A gamier meat. A gamier meat. I, you're with me, kid. I am not a big lamb guy. Yep, I'm not. But big, I get so that's the gaminess why, and how this could cut into. Yeah, so that's why the bolognese is a little more my style. Yeah, ragu al carne. Those are all good ones. So that's the 2017. Mm-hmm. Uh, Castello Bonfi, Brunello de Montalcino. That's kind of their wheelhouse. Um, we talked about the, uh, what's it called? Rosary Rosary Gally, Gally. The Red and we're not going to open it, but the La Petagola Vermentino. Yes. That's the Vermentino you make in Tuscany that has a little more richness than people perceive in, uh, or people taste in. I in. love Vermentinos. They're a little richer. Yep. Yeah. I have to, I've never uh, had you that. You take this to, bottle home. I have to try that. All right. Listen, we got to wrap up. We've spent a lot of time blabbering about all things Bonfi, which I enjoyed very much. Let me do a quick wrap up and then I want to get some info from you. So if you have a question, suggestion, wine happening or event, hit me up at sam at thegrapenation.com. That's sam at thegrapenation.com. Subscribe to the Grape Nation podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Why do we ask you to subscribe? Because as soon as the episode is released, You get it. You wake up and there's Christina right next to you. Can you beat that? Um, Follow us. Leave a review if you like the show. Follow us uh, on Instagram at SBenRuby, on Twitter at BenRuby. But you can always get to us through the hashtag TheGrapeNation. We're on Facebook at TheGrapeNation. As I mentioned, I will post Christina's wine list, all her good recos, and I will, in our weekly wine sip, um, give you the information on the Brunello and mention the other two wines, you know, which we talked about. So we'll give people information on that. Um, So, Christina, if we want to find out more about Bonfi, what's the best way? Bonfi, B-A-N-F-I, wines.com. Okay. And the website has it. It'll have the yes. Rose Regali, the Vermont. It'll, right. Yes. I mean, I've been or on the site a million be, times. You know, That's Instagram a good entree. Or, right. Right. I now, mean, really. let's talk social media. Okay. A lot of people use Instagram probably more than anything. That may be beyond my abilities. Oops. I don't know how that happened. Um, Instagram handle? Uh, Banfi.com. Okay. Yeah. No, not dot com. Uh, at at Bonfi. Oh, at Bonfi. Yeah, at Bonfi. I'm okay. sorry. Yeah, 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 you're yeah. right. Yeah. So, um, and do Fix you? That. I don't want to back you against the wall here. Do you have a personal account that you care about, or? Ah, uh, not so much. I use the okay. Bonfi. So account. stay with Bonfi. I gotta man. say. All right. So the website and Instagram certainly are the places to go. You know, when you want yes. information. Um, just one last message, Christina. Uh, final note from my friends at La Paule, announcing La Paule's return to New York City. There are tickets still available for the off-the-grid tasting on February 24th, shining a light on Discovery Wines from the region. The Verticals tasting on March 3rd, a great way to discover the ageability of Great Burgundy with each participating domain pouring one appellation over three vintages. And, of course, they're famous for the Grand Tasting and the Gala Dinner featuring over 30 Burgundy domains pouring their 2020 vintage. And at the gala, some older vintages and rare formats. So go to lapaulie.com for more information. That's that whole Burgundy thing. All right, I want to thank our guest, Christina Mariani May, our engineer, Armin, and everyone at the Heritage Radio Network. I'm Sam Ben Ruby, and you've been listening to The Grape Nation. The Grape Nation is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. 
food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.